Uh, thanks, Andrew. Is that we're going to be looking at polynomials of the following type. All right, we're going to start with a constant term. Uh, yeah, I, I like copy paste is being weird, so. Oh, I, I oh yeah, I can put this in the chat. That's a great idea. There you go. So the idea is that we have this polynomial and notice that it's ordered a bit differently than what you're used to. Instead of the exponents decreasing as it goes this way, the exponents are increasing. This is technically because this is sort of, you can think of this as an infinite polynomial where the exponents gets arbitrarily large, as big as we want. So there's a lot of rigor that I'm just like sweeping under the rug here, but for all intents and purposes that you'll see, this is a perfect way to handle them. So what are we going to do? So, and let's start by developing some properties of generating functions. So I have a very simple one here, perhaps the most simple one. Is there anything that we could do with this? Like any way that we could simplify this expression right here. Uh, I see an x to the n minus one over x minus one, but what's, what is n? What does n mean? And factoring sort of, but it doesn't because it's missing a lot of terms. We, we're supposed to be thinking of this as an infinite sum. So we need a formula that deals with infinity well. And in this case, that formula is sum of infinite series. Yes. You can write it like this. And already some people might be thinking, might be feeling uncomfortable with the way that we're doing this. And that's because, oh, look, what, what, what if x is like greater than one? What if x is two? Then this formula doesn't make sense. And this brings to mind an important distinction when talking about generating functions. Like 99% of the time, we're not going to be plugging in values for x. All we're doing is we're just using these as vessels to understand coefficients a bit differently. So let's say I gave you this function. Can somebody, can you all give me a closed formula for this? All right, I see somebody in the comments say X doesn't matter. It's just the exponents that are important. And that's half true. Or actually it's more like two fifths true because you need exponents and coefficients. And sometimes you can plug in values of X and the entire thing makes sense. So for example, this makes sense when the absolute value of x is less than one. And the whole, th it, the, way, the reason this works is because calculus and whatever, we don't want to do this. So I'm seeing a lot of one over one plus two x and we see it's, again, we have the sum of the geometric series formula. And notice that these are just equivalent ways of representing the same expression. So, yeah. Now let's take it a step up. Can somebody tell me a closed form for this? Uh, 
I'm I have not gotten anything correct yet. All right, I see I see some somebody who says Never mind. All right, so interesting. So PL, okay, so a lot of people are saying one over one minus X squared. And I have to ask you, how did you guys come to that conclusion? Ah, I see. So we're sort of, we're doing a sort of nice math counts type argument. What they're saying is we go like this. You have x plus 2x squared. Uh, we are recording. Thank you. And please do not spam my chats. All right. And we notice that we have a lot of symmetry here when we do this. So when we subtract, get 1 minus x times c of x is equal to, look, we have just the exact same thing as before. So when we solve this, we get here as desired. Great job, everybody. All right, so we have a few generating functions that we can play with, but it turns out that generating functions don't have to be, in, don't have to be infinite. So something that we could do is deal with finite generating functions. The best example of this is the binomial theorem. All right, and we know that this is equal to the following sum. All right, has everybody seen this before? I take it from the massive yeses in the chat that this is true. All right, the closed form of C of X, and I'll just make a note of it here, was one over one minus X squared. And you'd prove that using the sort of shifting argument. All right, so we could use this to do some nice things. So for example, let's prove the following identity. This is called Vandermond's identity. And there's a nice combinatorial way of looking at this, but we're just gonna ignore it completely. Vandermond's. There's, yeah, there's a great, and we're supposed to prove that this is equal to M plus N choose K. Yeah, there's a great way of proving this like using a uh, committee arguments, but not going to worry about that because that's not what I want to do. I want to do gen I want to do gen funk. So how might we prove this using generating functions? All right, so well, let's take a look at some coefficients. So we're going to evaluate this expression. Whoops. And then we're going to evaluate this expression at the bottom. And we're going to look at the coefficient of x to the k, or of yeah, let's say a bunch of stuff and then m plus n choose k times x to the k, y to the m plus n minus k. We actually are not going to plug in anything for here. 
So does everybody see that this is the coefficient of this term in this expansion? All right, cool. So now let's try, and we notice this is the right-hand side. So let's try and see if we can get the left-hand side with this expansion. So we're gonna have two terms that we're multiplying together. So let's say we, we take a look at this m to zero term. And that's gonna be, we'll just, let's just say x to the m. In order to get x to the k, Hmm, does this work out? It, it must work out, but. Actually, yeah, uh, forgive me. I'm going to change these y's to ones just so that it doesn't change the overall arguments and we can actually just get rid of a term. So we want the coefficient of x to the k now. Is everybody, is anybody not okay with this? All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at this. And let's, let's rearrange these so that they go in increasing order. Let's go all the way up to K. And let's say we're doing the same thing on this side. N choose zero plus N choose one X. Because any bigger exponents, we actually will not have to worry about. You can take my word for that. Okay, so when we multiply these, and then there's gonna be like plus other stuff on both sides, but we don't really matter. So we're gonna take one term from here, multiply it from another term from here, and we're gonna get an x to the k. So what's one way that we can combine one term from this side and one term from that side? Just give me one way. Pick a term from here, pick a term from here, and what you get is the product of like something times x to the k. All right, so one thing that we could do is we could pick x to the zero and x to the k. So let's see if I can color code. Yeah, we can combine these two. And now note that we've just extracted this term. Curious. Another thing that we could do is take this x and this x to the k minus one that's just missing. And then we'll get this next term over here. We could take this and that term and get this right here. All right, is anybody confused about what we're doing? We're just taking these and stitching them together in ways that get us an x to the k coefficient. So we see on the left-hand side, the coefficient of x to the k, when we expand this all out, is given precisely by this expression right here on the left. And we already knew this on the right, it worked out. And obviously these two are the same thing, we just broke them apart. So in total, that's how we can show this identity, just by comparing the coefficients of a polynomial. So, All right, so I have a slide that says like what generating functions are used for. We can prove combinatorial identities like this pretty handily. I won't go into that more in depth than what we've done right now. We can also do recursion. I'll get to that at the end because I think that will take a majority of our time. And what we can also do is like solve root counting problems. So, Something we can do, like an example of a really annoying question. 
six, six-sided die are rolled. How many ways to add Should I say dice? Okay. Add to what's a great what's a good number? Twelve. All right, so one thing that you could do is you could do casework with this, but I want to use this to show off just something that's generating function. Something cool to gener about generating functions and how they could ap approach this problem. All right, and what we can do is we can represent the numbers that you can get up as, co as exponents. So let's take a look at this polynomial. All right, notice these exponents are one, two, three, four, five, and six, which are exactly the possibilities that you can get when you roll a single die. We want to add numbers, so one thing that we could do is take a second die and multiply. So now let's take a look at the situation that we have here. All right, and let's just consider only these two variables. Let's try and get a coefficient of x to the second when we multiply these all. All right, we can get it in six possible ways. All right, just by considering each of these terms. So notice that these each correspond a way to rolling a seven using two die. All right, we can roll a six on the first one, a one on the second one, a five on the first one, and a two on the second one, so on and so forth, all the way up to a one on the first one, six on the second. And when we do this, we add the exponents because we're multiplying these terms together. And the number of terms is just the coefficient of this. And the coefficients is the number of ways that we can achieve this. That's really cool. So how can we use this observation to apply to this problem right here? So we have six die instead of two. So we're, instead, we're gonna multiply by this factor raised to the sixth. And then if we're going to add to 12, what does that mean we need to look for once we expand this? If we wanted to add to 12. I'd like to try and see more, more answers. Yeah, we want, we want the coefficient of x to the 12th because that represents ways that we can add this up. So as an example, let's take the combination 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, 6. All right, can somebody confirm for me that this adds up to 12? Wow, I'm so proud of everybody being able to do arithmetic. So, and I'm also glad that I, that includes me because I didn't screw this up. So what we can model this by is by saying, we can pick a one from here, a one from the next one, a one from the next one, a one to the next one. All right, a two from the second to last one and a six from the final one. And we'd multiply those all together. That counts for one combination. Please do not spam my chat. All right, it's because 
And this applies to all future lessons too, because I think I'm going to be doing many more of these. So what we can do here is we're going to want to multiply. Uh, are we going to be going over questions that don't care about order? That is interesting. Yeah, I'll actually, I'll, 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 I'll make a note about that. So the coefficient of x to the 12th. And what is that going to be? Uh, so what, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to simplify this because we don't want to expand this. That would just be like a lot worse. So one thing that we could do is, yes, find a closed form. All right. And we're going to want to do this with some of the geometric series. So if we add all these up, we get it. We get a total of x times 1 minus x to the seventh over 1 minus x, x to the sixth, actually. Is this correct? All right, this is for this innermost expression. Right, and notice how I'm taking care to write the constant terms and then this. So, and we're going to have to raise this to the sixth power. So that's x to the sixth times 1 minus x to the sixth to the sixth. This is getting really messy right now over All right, so now we have this. And we can expand this thing at the top easily enough. So that's x to the 6. That's going to be times 1 minus 6x to the 6 plus whatever. We don't care about those because these, those exponents are going to be massive. But then we're multiplying all this by 1 over. And as luck would have it, this is actually a known generating function. All right. All right, I won't go into this, but this is a good exercise to try and show that this is going to be equal to, let me erase this. Uh, six to six plus seven to six. I believe this is correct. Um, no, I, I don't No, I, I messed up. This is going to be 5 choose 5 plus 6 choose 5 x. Right, Andrew, can you check me on this? Uh, there is a general formula for this. I don't want to really prove it now, or maybe I will after this, but yeah. Because, yeah, maybe I should not have introduced this yet. So we want the coefficient of x to the 12th of this entire expression. So how can we get it? We can go, we have this x to the 6th here. So it's really just the coefficient of x to the 6th and this thing, excluding this. So let's go, we can notice that we can go all the way up to, what, 8 choose, or, um, 11 choose 5 times x to the 6th. So we can go x to the 6th, 1, 11 choose 5. Or we could go x to the 6th, negative 6x six to the 6th, 1. And those are our only two options because other people, because all other terms are going to be too big. So what does that look like? I will mark out a space right here. Right, so that's 11 choose 5 minus 6 times 5 choose 5. That's the answer. You guys can evaluate that if you want. But, all right, this is provided that I got this stuff correct, which. I think I did, but. Is there a different way to find the coefficient? If you're using the generating functions approach, this is going to be the best. If you're doing this approach, 12 is small enough so that you can list. 
list everything out, and then just like apply combination formulas. All right, I am not able to change names while I'm teaching because that's distracting. So please ask somebody else. So yeah, that was this process. It was a bit brutal, but we got this nice expression for this. And what did we do? We modeled the die using this generated function in here. Six die is equivalent to multiplying by the six times. And then we just found a certain coefficient by changing it. Uh, as a matter of fact, I did change this into an infinite one. But it actually doesn't matter because at some point past here, everything's going to start canceling out. So this is a really important distinction to make. Thanks. Thank you for that question. So notice how this generating function has a finite number of terms. But this one that we created on the bottom, I'll box them both in red so you can see that they're equal. Oops. All right, this, that first, this first term is fine. The last term in this ends up being like plus x to the 36, I think. So this one is the end. But this one you can see is infinite. So this one's a finite one, but this one's an infinite one. And how can that be? It turns out it doesn't make a difference. And this is because at some point, there's some combinatorial identity that will let me say that this cancels out. And I think this is a pretty slick way of proving such an identity because we know that this has to work. I don't want to get into these details right now because they're kind of boring, like a lot of these details can be. But does anybody have any questions for me that I can go over for everybody? This is one of those rare times where I can take questions. Who am I? That's a great question. I don't know. Any questions that are actually relevant and constructively could help the class? Okay. I guess you all really understand this content. So we're going to move on. Okay, we're about halfway done through class. I'm going to do a brief thing to talk about partitions. All right, can anybody define for me what a partition is? Uh, I'm seeing a lot of definitions that are really close, but there's a subtle distinction. I'm getting a lot of things that's like a partition of a number is the number of what uh, is like a way to split it up into things. Yeah. Without order. And yeah, so we're looking at the uh, partition number. So let's take a look at how we can break up four. You can break it up into one plus one plus one plus one. You can break it up into two plus one plus one. And we can just break it up into four. Am I missing anything? Uh, I don't, I do not believe I am. So yeah. So we want to count the number of ways that we can do this. And let's see if we can create a generating function for this. So this generating function is actually really nice, even though the actual formula is horrendous, like really, really horrendous. This is uh, finding a way, finding an approximation for it is one of Ramanujan's the greatest achievements. Fun fact. So partitions, okay, so let's do the similar thing. Let's say we're looking at, let's say we're looking at AX and we're looking at something plus A1X plus A2X squared. And we're gonna say that this coefficient A sub K is the number of distinct part partitions of K. So the way that we're gonna model this is as follows. We can have a bunch of one parts. 
All right, let's just assume that these are all in order because we can always do that. So for the one parts, these are all the possible ways that we could add a certain number of ones. This is, we're contributing no ones, one, one, two ones, three ones, four ones, so on. But we can also contribute twos. That's one plus x squared plus x to the fourth. How am I getting these? Well, if I'm adding a bunch of twos, I can only get the sums 0, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, so on. And then I could do the same thing for threes. What's well, stop there? I can just keep on going forever. And that's, in fact, what we're going to do. So we already know how to simplify the first expression. All right, only the first four make a difference though. Yes, but we want this to include every single, every single one. We're finding a generating function for every single partition. Uh, what about this next term? Is, how can we simplify this? Write it like one over one minus x squared. This one, one over one minus x cubed. It's the same geometric series and so on. So we get the generating function for this is really nice. All right, finding an explicit formula for this is pretty horrendous. I encourage you to look it up if you want, but it's not something that's within the scope of this class by any means. Okay, so let's get to let's get to some recursion stuff. So there are like some problems in here that I, we didn't end up going over, but oh, but before we go to recursion. This is also a cool trick. All right, and this is how we're gonna motivate this problem. All right, I want you guys to think about this for a minute and think how you might go about it. Uh, what is on top of the E? I am not, everybody can see the slides, right? You see this? Okay, that question confuses me. Oh, on top of the sigma thing? Oh, there's nothing on top of it. It's just that when k gets really, really big, all the terms become zero. It's written like this by lazy mathematicians. So everybody's had a minute to think about this. Do you have any ideas? Any constructive ideas? Is the max term to add less than 100? Uh, no, it, it gets pretty big. What's k? k isn't just an integer. Oh, is, are, are there people who aren't sure about the sigma notation? I'll take care of that here. So we're looking at this sum. Uh, 
Uh, I'm unsure about the actual answer is. It is definitely not 150,150. So how are we gonna evaluate this? All right, well, one way that we could do this is by using the binomial theorem. Because we know that we can get the sum of every single binomial coefficients by plugging in x is equal to one. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, it is k is greater than or equal to zero. I just put a 33 at top for, for cleanliness. So if we plug in x equals one to this expression, we get the sum of every single binomial coefficient, but that's not what we want. So this trick that I'm about to show you is what is called the roots of unity filter. So we're gonna use this thing from complex numbers called roots of unity. which we denote by one omega and omega squared. All right, these are complex numbers such that omega cubed is equal to one. And one property that they have that's of a special interest to one. Uh, below the epsilon there is k is equal to zero and it goes up to 33. So we're just like saying for this, we want to evaluate this expression where k is equal to zero, then when k is equal to one, then when k is equal to two. So an important property of here is that omega squared plus omega plus one is equal to zero. And yeah, I'm actually going to add in a term in the middle here, that's gonna be necessary. 100 choose two x squared plus. And since here is I still need clarification for this, all the sum is just 100 choose zero plus 100 choose three. These two things are just different notations for exactly the same. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna exploit this. So we're gonna plug in x equals one, omega and omega squared. So for the first one, we get two to the 100 is equal to Okay, so let, now let's plug in omega. Huh. So we get one plus omega to the 100th is it gonna be equal to omega squared times 100 choose two. all the way up to plus omega times 100 choose 100. Okay, so now why did I put omega instead of omega to the 100th here? What allows me to do that? All right, why am I putting omega instead of omega to the 100th? All 
All right, the reason is because of this property right here. Omega cubed is equal to one, so we can just raise this to the 33rd power, then multiply it by omega, and that's how we get this. But now we can do a similar thing here. So you see that we have sort of these columns that we can now add. So then what we do is we can add these. And now notice what happens in like here and like here. We have 100 choose two times one plus omega plus omega squared, one plus omega plus omega squared. And what do we say that one plus omega plus omega squared was equal to? We said it was equal to zero. Yeah, so these are gonna cancel out. All right, what's not gonna cancel out, this is also gonna cancel out too. This is not gonna cancel out. And in fact, no multiple of three will. And that's the real magic behind the roots of unity filter. So remember one plus omega plus omega squared is equal to zero. So when we add this up, we can even simplify this. Two to the 100th plus negative omega squared to the 100th plus negative omega to the 100th is gonna be equal to three So is anybody confused about how I got to here? You can answer me if you want. I would prefer answers from people who haven't heard of generating functions before. but they appear to not have access to chats. So I don't know. So we have this and it turns out that when we expand this, we get negative one. So we take this, uh, can I explain the second to last line again? Are you talking about this one that I'm like sort of bolding, error, trying to make an arrow to? Oh, at the bottom of the page. Are you talking about this line? Yeah, okay, great, I can do that. All right, so the point is, I'm trying to get this cancellation, this one plus omega plus omega squared cancellation. So I'm plugging in different values for x. And this is 100% fine, because this is a finite generating function. So I plug in omega, and the binomial theorem just gives me this. And because omega cubed is equal to one, these powers are just gonna go like one omega omega cubed, one omega omega cubed, so on and so forth, and we end here. And it's the exact same thing here. But you notice I go from omega squared to omega. That's because we know that omega to the fourth is equal to omega. Because again, it's the third root of unity. So we do that. We can simplify these because we know that this is true. And we have this expression. So then we go into here. And this, we can simplify further using this. And it works out to two to the 100th minus one over three. And this becomes our answer, some gigantically big number. So this is the roots of reality filter. It allows us to get these like sort of weirder sums where the offset is like not like one or two. Are there any questions about this?
I'm gonna hope not because we need to get, we need to get to recursion. Yeah, I need to leave in like nine minutes, so this might be a bit fast. So recursion, solving for recursions is one of the great benefits of this. So we're gonna take a look at this example. Say a n is equal to two a sub n minus one minus a sub n minus two. All right, we'll worry about starting initial terms later. But if you want them, uh, they can just we can just choose zero and one. So let's say that we have this generating function a of x that's equal to basically it has all these all these coefficients of the recursion in a row. Yeah, so say a of zero is zero, a of one is equal to one, a of two is equal to, what is it, two? a of three is equal to th three, I guess, a of four is equal to four, curious. But let me spice it up actually. Uh, I don't like this, I don't like this example. Make this a three and this a two. Let's say that a of zero is equal to two and a of one is equal to three. So then a of two is gonna be equal to what, five? A of three is gonna be equal to what, nine and so on. It's a bit more complicated this time. So we have this thing. So we have a of zero plus a sub one x plus a sub two, x squared plus a sub three, x cubed, and so on. So to solve this, we're gonna use a similar trick to what we did at the beginning to make almost all the terms cancel. So we're gonna say, we're gonna minus, subtract three x, a x, and we're gonna add two x squared, a sub x. So what happens? What do we just do? You just shifted the terms, perfect. So this is what we get. Like that. So notice that like basically all of these are gonna cancel. Like this cancels because of the recursion. This cancels because of the recursion. Everything afterwards is gonna cancel because of this recursion. We just move all the terms to one side and we get this sum is equal to zero. So yeah, this cancels, this cancels, this cancels. When we add all these up, that is. So thus we get after minimal amount of effort is one minus three X plus two x squared, a sub x is equal to, what did we say that a zero was two? And then three minus six is minus four x. Huh, this does not seem right, but, oh, minus three x, of course. Is anybody confused right now? You can ask, you can answer to me. So I wanna try and go over this a bit better. Okay, let's keep going. So then we have the generating function for X. I'm gonna erase all this. Hope I'm taken by your lack of questions that you understood exactly what went on here. And we're going to just solve for a of x, but we want, we want to do it a bit better. a of x is equal to two minus three x over one minus three x plus two x squared. All right, so this is all nice and good, but it isn't really that helpful. 
we want to do what's called partial fraction decomposition. So we can factor the bottom as one minus two X times one minus X. So it turns out by the method of partial fraction decomposition, we know that we can rewrite this as the following, sort of splitting apart this fraction. So it turns out if you solve this, I won't go through the details here because they're quite boring, but you can check to see that it works, is that these are gonna both be ones. Now, does anybody remember what this was the generating function of? This one right here. Ah, okay, why is it two minus three X over here? Uh, I do not believe it should be three minus four X because A zero is equal to two. Yeah, th this is definitely correct. I, I wrote, I had it all written out and everything. Yeah, this is equal to one plus X plus X squared plus X cubed, perfect. You can also write it as as just this. How about this one right here? Well, it's the same thing. It's also a geometric series. So we could say two to the K, X to the K. So when we combine this, we get some that this was a of x all along. But look, what we've just done is we found a closed formula for this term. If we know by solving this recursion, that a sub k is equal to two to the k plus one. I think that's kind of neat. So yeah, this method could be used to solve any recursion. What you do is you, you write out the generating function, make it so that this recursion cancels, then apply decomposition to split up this fraction, convert them to what we know they are. And then this long process basically just gives us an equivalent way of saying the same thing. Are there any other questions? I need to get, get going really soon. And the coefficients of the terms? Exactly. If any of you want an exercise to test this for yourself, uh, you can do the, you can solve the recursion, c of zero is equal to one, c of n is equal to the sum of k is equal to zero, n minus one. Uh, c of k, c, n minus one minus k. This recursion right here, it's quite famous. It generates what are called the Catalan numbers. And the proof is by generating functions. Okay, any more questions? All right, I'm gonna end it here. Thanks all for coming. <laughs>